Okay, and with that, we will get going. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to a very special edition of our Human Performance Webinars. I'm your host, James Grigson, and today I'm joined by Daniel Chan and Dr. Craig Duncan. Before we get into introductions of the two gentlemen joining me today, I just wanted to thank everyone for joining a very special edition of these, these Human Performance Webinars. You'll notice uh, we are going to start doing some more tailored webinars to the Singapore and Asian market. It does not mean that our global audience cannot join these. We certainly encourage it so. But we have seen some topics and suggestions and a lot more interest um, in tailored and specific webinars from this area and from these markets. And with that, we've decided to section off a segment of, of our webinars and dedicate that towards topics that the, this market and this area um, are asking. So. With that and with more resources and efforts put into the Singapore and Asia area, I'd like uh, in this platform to introduce Daniel Chan down there on our screen. Daniel Chan has recently joined us. He's our first employee out of Singapore. Daniel, say hello to the, the Fusion family. Hi guys, how's, it, how's everyone going? Thank you, Daniel. So Daniel's joined us after a, a long time in customer service and, and sales in the re retail um, and customer service hospitality industries over 20 years there. Um, we saw a lot of care, uh, the care that you need to, to um, put up with the hospitality industry, if I can put it so bluntly. Um, and I, I saw a lot of care in Daniel and he's, um, we, we look forward to seeing that care uh, and commitment to our customer base here at Fusion Sport. So with that, I want to introduce Dr. Craig Duncan. Craig is joining us today for uh, our first special webinar here for Asia and Singapore. Craig, after completing his PhD in 2002, has gone on and, and serviced our industry uh, tremendously. He's a, he's a voice for, for our industry and for sports scientists and high performance managers within the sporting sector. Um, a, a true leader as the industry has evolved in the early 2000s out of Australia and started up his own business performance intelligence agency in 2008, consulting with many teams and organizations across the globe, and increasingly now more recently in workforce as well. Uh, Craig is a lecturer at the Australian Catholic University, and most notably worked with the Australian football, so the Australian Socceroos team, and guided them to victories um, at the 2015 Male Asian Cup. So Craig, I will leave it all to you. You're, you're, you're here today to talk to us about the importance of athlete data monitoring, best practice and best use cases. So I'll leave it all to you, my friend. Uh, thank you very much, James and Daniel. Thank you. And thank you for everyone listening here today and for your time. So what I'll do is I'll just get my presentation up here. <clears throat> And we'll just get this started. Um, <clears throat> look, it's what I'm going to discuss today is basically just monitoring an athlete performance. And I've had a long association with SmarterBase uh, yeah, over over a decade now of working uh, and using the the product from Fusion. And uh, look, I've used other products on the market, but just for me, this has been the best product that I've I've seen in respect to the work that I do. I want to take you through um, what basically monitoring is because it's it's often new and trying to get people to understand it and see how it can work with you and work with the athletes or the people that you're actually working with. So let's just uh, get started. And look, there'll be time for questions at the end. And even after this presentation, if there's any any questions that you, you have or you, you remembered later on, please feel free to ask them. I'm always there to, to help in any way I can. <clears throat> um, James gave me a good introduction, so I don't need to go any, any further. I've been a long time in the, in the performance industry, and, uh, but we'll, we'll move on from there. So thanks, James, for that. Look, I see my role as a, a sports scientist or a human performance strategist as bridging the gap between, between the data and actually giving insight to our coaches or whoever our leader is. That's what the most important thing is. And I think sometimes we get caught up in 
the more the technology that is out there, the more the numbers there, we just sort of give that to our coaches and, and to our staff and to our players without actually interpreting it. The numbers are just a vehicle for us to provide basic insight and then further down the track is to provide intelligence. And that's what we need to really understand. <clears throat> because this is what often a coach sees or whatever leader is that we might come from a science background and collect all this information on our, on our athletes and we present it to them and that's what they see. Uh, it might look beautiful to us, but for many, it's just a, just a whole bunch of numbers and we need to get away from that. And, and that gets back to that bridge I was talking about. It's easy to pr produce the numbers, but data on its own <clears throat> without insight and without intelligence is is no good at all. And it's not going to enhance our performance of that, the people that we're trying to get to perform. I always like to start in my work with what does the coach actually want or the person or the organization I'm working with? What are you trying to achieve here? And then I will mold into what you are trying to achieve rather than me bring my theories and methodology that might not match yours. We can be very flexible in what we, what we do, and I know what we can do has a great impact on performance, but not if the coach isn't involved in that conversation. So if you're listening to this and you're a coach or you're a practitioner and you're working in a sports science area, it's imperative that these discussions are at the start, but they're ongoing on a daily basis. The communication in high performance sport often is, leaves a little bit to be desired. So we need to really work on that. So that's the starting point for me because it gets back just what I've been saying. And remember this uh, as we go through the presentation, data on, it, on its own, it drives us nowhere. But what we want to get to is insight and then ultimately intelligence. And this is where we, we really need to strive for this. At the moment, a lot of what we do in the sports science fraternity just stops at data, okay? And it's very easy to collect data. And the more technology comes in, the more you'll be, okay, I'm gonna get more and more data, but okay, with data without going through this into insight and without ultimately gaining intelligence, it's not going to get us a net gain in performance. So that is what we need to be clear on. So what is this monitoring thing that I'm talking about? Well. Basically, it's an observation of a player or an athlete pre, during or post training competition in order to maximize the potential to perform. An athlete is an athlete 24 seven, but they're not with you all that time. So we've got a lot of time where we need to monitor what they're doing outside of what we're doing on the training pitch or on the track or wherever ever we're working with them to see, to get this holistic view of performance. And that's where monitoring is a key part of what I do. Just having a look at some of the literature around that or the research, well, we know that monitoring has a significance. It will reduce the likelihood of negative training adaptations or to identify differences between the prescribed and actual dose of training. will determine an athlete's readiness to compete. We all talk about this. Are they ready to perform when they need to perform? And it's especially important in a team sport environment, okay, where it's often really neglected. So common methods of athlete monitoring, well, we can look at internal load of like, this is where we're training and we start to quantify the load, such as, you know, rating of perceived exertion, heart rate, or GPS is growing in, in many years and becoming more popular. Um, monitoring fitness, so testing, submaximal testing, all the sorts of fitness tests that are out there. But there's also this key area of monitoring fatigue. So blood and saliva markers, you could use a counter movement jump, subjective questionnaires, heart rate, sleep. I could go on and on and on about the things that we can actually monitor. But it's all about this athlete fatigue. And what is that? It's basically a state of weariness preceded by a period of physical and or mental exertion resulting in a diminished performance capacity. Uh, I work quite a lot across the Asian region. And what I find is sometimes the training is outstanding, okay? But the fatigue also grows. 
And so we don't get that real overall positiveness in performance because we work very hard at training, but training needs to also have recovery uh, to get the desired performance. So what does that really look like if we just go through this? So we have training load. So we train and we have fatigue. And then on this side, we have recovery. So training takes us down here, we're, we're fatigued, but we need recovery to get up to this positive adaptation or what's called often is super compensation. So this is ideal and this is where we want to go. So what that looks like is that we get this continual training load spaced out with recovery through good monitoring that we get a positive improvement in performance. Sadly, what happens often is this scenario training load or recovery, reduce performance. So we've got inadequate training, uh, sorry, we've got adequate training load, but it's prescribed in the wrong dosage without monitoring and we can get this complete detriment in performance without us even knowing. So through monitoring, this saves me from making these mistakes. <clears throat> So this is how I look at performance. The equation is the relationship between an athlete's capacity minus what I call the noise. Okay, so capacity, that's what we focus along in, often in coaching and everything. We want to improve them, their physiological status. Uh, it could be a team, team dynamics, tactics, technical, uh, training, fitness, all that sort of stuff is building the capacity. But there's a trade-off. There's also this area that I call the noise physiological fatigue, injury, stress, cognitive fatigue. And that actually will take away from your capacity. So there's no point us increasing capacity and also increasing the noise because we won't get this ultimate gain in performance. So my whole life is to get performance better in any person that I work with. So I'm looking at this, but I wanna reduce this, reduce the noise, manage the noise whilst increasing the capacity. I actually think increasing the capacity is an easy part of the equation. What is more difficult is managing that noise. And some people, and you might be out there and you don't even know what that noise is because you're not monitoring at this stage. I always work from this decision-making model I call the Affirm model, um, where we go through an area where we analyze what we're, what we're doing, we formulate a plan, we forecast the outcome, okay? Even before training, we forecast the outcome of the training of what we expect. We implement the training program and then we reflect on that. But the key to this at all stages of this decision-making model is that we're monitoring. We're knowing what is going on at all stages of what we are doing. <clears throat> So then it comes down to this, okay, well, what do we, what do we monitor? And the, it's absolutely endless of what we can. You know, sleep is very important. Someone asked me this question just yesterday. If you can only monitor just a few things of the athlete, what would you do? And sleep definitely is very important. Psychological stress, neuromuscular fatigue, hormone status, and it goes on and on and on. So you've got in-training monitoring, which would be your GPS and or your training load or your, your tonnage if you're doing strength training. But then you've got all these outside factors to really know what's going on with your athlete. What I will say about that is this is an endless number of variables that you can monitor but what we need to do is package it so you have a system and a strategy to again go back to what I said at the start. Data leads to insight, which ultimately what we want is intelligence. And this is where uh, I, I use the product from SmarterBase. And SmarterBase is, is basically an athlete monitoring system. It's much more than that, but um, it takes into account and it's a place for me to have all this data to be able to identify it on a daily basis by looking at my dashboards by, so it's got a collection aspect of it where we collect the data from our athletes, collect the data from the technology that we're using, comes into our system so we can display that in respect to dashboards um, and ultimately for me to be able to feed intelligence out to the coaching or, or the athlete. 
because there's so many people involved and that's why we need a system to collect all our data and to integrate it. Rather than working in silos, I wanna have my data in one place and the integration of that data. And that's what SmarterBase allows me to do because we've got fitness coaches, we've got allied health professionals, rehab specialists, psychologists, dietitians, sports scientists, all these people, coaches, everyone wanting a piece of your athlete. But where is all that information going? Where is all that information stored? I need it to be stored in one place so I can get really good insight and then ultimately intelligence. There is an explosion of technology and I've used it all. Trust me on that one. So GPS, I, we, we actually have been using GPS since 2002 and it's now 2021 throughout the region that a lot of people have just started using this technology and they think, okay, I've got to get GPS, but not if you don't know how to integrate all the data. You know, we, we've done work with Apple and integrated the technology from Apple, um, other forms of testing, but it's endless how much technology is out there. And in this information age, if we don't manage it well, it, all it is is going to be dead data rather than a live data that ultimately makes a difference. So it doesn't matter if I'm working with athletes, if I'm working with corporate, if I'm working with military, at the end of the day, these people that we're working with, we want to perform at their optimal state. And this is how we got to get to that place with whatever technology we use, but we don't want to override ourselves with too much technology that doesn't, doesn't really, at the end of the day, make a difference. So this is a sample of, of what happens is that every morning uh, a player would put in their, their data, whatever that is, or it could come from some of their technology. And then I have a dashboard so I can look at all my athletes and I can know, all right, well, where are they at in respect to their optimal performance zone? And we can do this through customized algorithms to go, okay, they are in their optimal performance zone or they're not. And it's very clear. So you've got an eye on your athlete rather than just turning up to training and you thinking that you know where they are, that you're thinking you know that they're okay to go. But then, you know, we've all been in that situation where an athlete gets injured, they have a soft tissue injury, such as a hamstring or a quad injury. And much of that could have been prevented if we were really managing the noise and ultimately set it out like this so we know where the athlete, athlete was. We've used it extensively. <clears throat> um, uh, when uh, James mentioned that I was with the Australian national team and when your athletes aren't with you. So with the Australian national team, we would have 60, 60 plus players on the coach's radar. They were all over the world in multiple countries around the world. They could be in Bulgaria, they could be in Russia, they could be in the UK, they could be in Japan, they could be in the Middle East. But every day they would log into our system, the SmarterBase system, they would have an application, there'd be some questions there for them to answer, they'd put that information in and we would have that information to report back to the coaches even when they were not with us. Now, it's very powerful that the, we would report this on a weekly basis and be able to give this key information to the coaches before they chose their team. And then we could give them a training match report. So all this data comes from SmarterBase and then through our customized algorithms here, from all the information we could, were gathering, we could give the score uh, of the players out of, a, out of 10 actually, and to identify where they were. So the coach could go through all this from a physiological and psychological status, say, okay, they're in the green, they're ready to go. So if, it's, if a camp is coming up, if a game is coming up, I know this player is in the physical and psychological condition ready for me to go. They've done enough training, they've played enough matches. Where this one in the red, there is possibly a problem. So the idea is we predict the training load, we train, we recover, and whilst we're monitoring, we have to identify then there's a negotiation whether the next training is going to match where our players are at. So you can't do that if you do not have um, a system to collect that information. 
if you're not staying in tune with your athletes. <clears throat> so this is what it might look like. A program you can see here, this is, this is a program formulated by us. This is the loading that we predict this session should have. Okay, so, so here it is. This is how long it should be, the high speed meters, what the RPE should be, all this, the intensity, as much information. Okay, so that would be given to the coach in a meeting at the start of the week. They do this session and then this session, this session. However, there's a process in place. They do the session and then this report comes. We create this report. Here's some of the GPS data. This data is all fed into to SmarterBase as well. And then we get have a dashboard exactly like this to see, okay, did all players perform as we expected them to perform? You can see here that there's a, there's a few players in red. Why are they in red? Because they're below what were the expectations. So we're monitoring them through that, that situation, okay, and identify. But the key point here is, so that's insight. And then the intelligence is, well, yeah, overall, the session met our requirements and expectations. Good. Here we are. Here's another forecast. This in the blue is our forecast for that session. This is what actually happened in that session. So it's a little bit outside our forecast. And then instantly, we can adjust the next training's program, to a next training day's program. So it's an agile work in progress rather than being stuck in stone. I can only do this if I'm collecting the data and storing it in the right, right format um, so that I can really give this intelligence to the coaching staff. <clears throat> However, there's a key, there's another place of this. So we predict the training session. The training session goes ahead. We get the data from, the, from that session. It appears that the players or the athlete could be an individual athlete, could be... <clears throat> could be military, it could be a corporate person, doesn't matter. Whatever they were meant to do, they did, and it seemed to be achieved. However, we don't know how they responded post-training. So they go to sleep, and then they wake up in the morning, they pick up their, um, their cell phone, their mobile phone, and then there is questions from on our SmarterBase app for them to answer. There could be data from their Apple Watch or even their Aura ring here that I've got that just seamlessly goes into the cloud. And then we have a format to see, is the response as we expected? So this is a key part of the training process that's often neglected. And so you can see here, this is an a customized algorithm that they're all in green. This player here is in, is in orange, so we might check up, but overall, and then through some of our objective variables, heart rate variability and resting heart rate. And we can see overall, they've responded as we expected. And then we know that the next training day or that training session for that day, we would suggest that the players are ready to complete that. <clears throat> so here is further dashboards of what this looks like for every individual player. You can see where they are in respect to their normal zone. And I talk about their optimal zone. You know, where are they in respect to their optimal performance index? And these dots are doing that. How does this compare to previous data? <coughs> How is their hydration? And all this can be in one place. And, 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 and there is here, this is the intelligence. Here is insight, this is the intelligence. Basically going, from a thousand data points coming down to, yeah, look, fatigue scores are positive and above our expectations. So that's good. Some sleep issues, but hydration, heart rate variable, variability uh, is positive. So overall, we're in a good place. So, okay, you could say to me, all right, Craig, what does that all really mean? And how does that translate? It translates quite significantly. If you look at the Australian national team, and I've worked with multiple national teams, by the way, in football. So I was with the Iran national team for the 215, uh, 219 Asian Cup as well. And it's the same thing. We can put this, put this into any, any area. But if we look at the 
2018 World Cup, the player non-availability was at an all-time low of 0.01% over a, a preparation time of six weeks leading into that first game. That's a 0.01% of training availability. Now, look, it's not all down to what I do. I mean, there's obviously luck in this, but that's incredible. The previous best that we had was 2 to 4% in the 2015 Asian Cup when I first came in with the Australian national team. And this is when we implemented the monitoring from 2014 after the World Cup in Brazil. But look at that. They had a 15% non-availability rate leading into the 2014 World Cup. And look at the change. And I'll, I'll be perfectly honest with you, the major change was the monitoring that I advocate monitoring is done on a daily basis, whether you're in camp or out of camp. Um, and that was the major, major factor. Interesting enough, when I left the Australian national team and um, <clears throat> went back uh, to, uh, to, another, to another nation, some of their policies changed and they didn't monitor probably as extensively I did. And then their, their rate of availability was much lower uh, was much worse than this 2015 Asian Cup. Again, it's not all about the monitoring, but I'm a massive believer in it. Any team that we work with, it's absolutely any athlete we team with, and we work across codes as well, that the monitoring is the fundamental part of, um, of what we do. Absolutely fundamental. It's core. And uh, I think as much as I love data, it's always not always about the data. I say that always, it's not always about the data. Very important because the other beauty of that monitoring and that information is that it can create a conversation. So I might see someone, okay, they're in the red zone, but then I need to have a conversation with my athlete, but I've got something to converse to them about because I've done this uh, monitoring. And so it's about these relationships, relationships with your physiotherapists, relationships with your coaches, relationships with your players. So they understand what they're doing. I'm very big that we need to educate our players, educate our athletes. So they're part of this process. Display the data to them, just not collect the data because they become part of, of what you're doing. All right, this could be completely new to you. What do you, what do, you do with this monitoring system? <clears throat> well, firstly, you've got to start slow. All right, we just start off really slow. We implement it and then we educate. We need to educate coaches. We need to educate players and athletes. Players and staff have to see the value. All right, they have to see the value. I've got a number of publications that clearly show that monitoring will add value if done correctly. And we need to have very good communication. Key to this is you must have an effective data management system. I, our company always has used Smarterbase um, for all our successful years. Why? It's because I believe it's the best system on the market. Okay, I'm not paid to say that in any way. I just believe that that's the case. And James would know if, it, if there is any issue and he would know, I, I will ask about that issue and it needs to be fixed. The service of the organization is, is outstanding and the flexibility and being able to customize this, this system really makes it work for me. It's by far and away um, the, the better systems. And I, I, in my experience, have been able to see all the systems that are out there. So you must have that system in place. <clears throat> now, the issues in the applied setting is managing the data and how you're going to use the data. And because it becomes, okay, how am I going to set this up? Is it difficult for me? Um, you know, how, what does this data mean? And, and I mean, I know Smarterbase are very good at helping that situation. My company, PIA, we specialize in that and helping people implement SmarterBase into their programs as well and what to actually look at, all right? So it doesn't become a big burden for you. Um, it's only as good as 
how much your players and athletes adhere to it, you know, that they get that buy-in. And then we've always got to listen and observe, you know, that reflection phase of my decision model to see, okay, what can we do to do it better? I'm always thinking, okay, how can we do this and do it better? So in summary, player athlete monitoring, it will reduce the risk of injury and it will improve performance. I feel absolutely confident about that because I've had 20, 25 years of this being involved in this space. And I also know in the workforce, it will reduce sick leave and it will improve performance. The same in military, it will reduce injury and it will improve performance. Wherever we go with this uh, monitoring concept, it will make a difference. Even in school, in university, we've just recently done a project at a university monitoring the well-being of student athletes, and we noticed incredible results with that. It was it was just incredible improvement in well-being, um, improvement in university uh, results was was incredible. It was a wonderful um, project that we were just involved in. It's important to have a systematic approach and the data must be interpreted, otherwise it's dead data. And remember that data must lead to, lead to um, insight that ultimately what we're about is leading to intelligence. That's me done, James. So uh, questions? Craig, that was fantastic. Thank you. Um behalf of, of us and, and the glowing things you, you said about uh, smarter base but um thank you on behalf of the audience as well so what we'll do for, for those in the audience you have a couple of functionalities there's the chat function if you're a typer if you're a talker like me um there's a, a raise hand button and i can allow you to talk so you can uh, speak with craig and myself um as you can note here craig's contact information is is on the screen at the moment so as as craig said at the top of the call if you don't want to chat now, you feel free to email a, a question into Craig. I will kick things off with a question, Craig. Um, from, yes, a, yes. from a practical implementation perspective, when you've come into environments um, where there is a limited data culture um, that already exists. So what I mean by that is they're not, the organization is not currently monitoring. The athletes aren't used to inputting information or wearing wearables. Um, the coaching staff aren't used to having these insights and might be a bit hesitant to um, want to begin to see different data or, or at least from what I've seen, people, um, you know, sort of feel like they don't want to be told what to do. Yeah. How, what are the techniques have you gone about implementing uh, a monitoring system in an environment whereby uh, it, doesn't, it didn't it previously exist and you are met with those personal barriers? Yeah, I think it's a great question, James. Uh, and, and it always starts with me with a conversation with the, with the organization and the main, um, the key stakeholders in what we're doing so that I can present. And it's about that education piece that it's a win-win situation, that it's actually not going to take over what they're doing. It's going to be part of the process. I think one of the most interesting ones was that recent project we did in the, in the J-League in Japan where it had never been done before. And it was very, uh, yeah, culturally quite different to actually monitor and, and talk about this uh, information. But it was the way we did it was we educated the players, educated the coaching staff so they could see, okay, all right, this is, this is where it fits in. And I think what I showed in the presentation is that it's a part of the training process that we might have been missing. It's, it's not something that we're uh, putting in that should be new. It is actually part of the process that people see. Okay, well, you train, they go home, they recover. All we're doing is we're not guessing anymore. We're putting data to that and then giving you the intelligence. I do know it's, uh, it can be diffi uh, difficult, but I think it's about really understanding what you're doing, having a system, and it's like I said, James, you know, it starts slow. I, I would just start, okay, if we're going to start, let's start with a, you know, a four question wellness in the morning, getting the players to log in and, and putting that information in. And then we can build from there. I, I think that's absolutely the way they do it. I remember when I first started, this was even back before really using too much technology. It was uh, a, a one question uh, on a scale of one to 10, how ready are you to train today? <laughs> you know, so yeah. 
Oh, and, and even in times like this where resources are, are cut, funding's cut, um, and maybe personnel are cut as well, going back to basics has been a trend that we've seen personally in the industry. Um, so it's funny you mentioned that. Uh, it, it can be very basic when you, when, you, when you want it to be. We have a question from the audience. Um, for a, a semi-professional team, what would be the best hardware and software to monitor sleep, in your opinion, Craig? Yeah, that's a, that's a fantastic question. Um, look, I, I think really, if you, if you have no money at all, you know, the subjective quality, um, measurement of sleep of identifying exactly how many hours you're sleeping or what time you're going to sleep and what time you're awake. So we can put that into SmarterBase. Okay, what time did you go to sleep? What time did you awake? And then we know how many hours you slept. And then for people just to rate their sleep on a subjective scale that we have, we find that quite uh, powerful. Um, <clears throat> however, I do, and I've used most uh, sleep monitors out there. Um, what I find is, um, look, I'm a big fan of, Apple doesn't need me to publicize them, but uh, I am a big fan of the Apple Watch as, as my, my preference. However, I don't like to sleep with a watch. So I don't know if you can see that, James. I, I don't know if you've got one too. Recently, the Aura Ring has, has um, I think, really progressed. And, it, and it's my one that I monitor sleep with, with athletes that don't want to wear a watch to bed. So I find this ring is very powerful um, in that regard. So that gives me great information. And that can seamlessly go into uh, SmarterBase, by the way, which just makes life really easy. Um, there are other ones that go on the mattress. There's one called Bedit that I used in 2015 at the Asian Cup. Um, that, that is good. But uh, if I was to be pressed on what I would use, I, I think the watches, and it doesn't have to be an Apple Watch. There's Garmin, there's Polar, um, a Samsung would have a sleep function as well um, but then I really do like the ring if you don't if you don't want to wear a watch to bed. I hope that answered the question for the audience there. Um, I, I don't see any other questions or, or hands raised at this time so on that note we just wanted to thank everybody um, for, for joining. I'm speaking very slowly just in case someone's typing. I want to thank Craig, I want to thank Daniel and everyone who's joined. There is a recording that will be sent out to everyone that's that's viewed live and also a recording to people that haven't been able to join us. Um, if you want to share that, please do. Thank you very much again. Thank you, Craig. Everyone, oh, we have one more question. Well done, Jens. You got in just before the end. So Jens has asked, how will you handle the players in training which are reporting a poor recovery score, e.g. soreness or sleep? So how do you deal with those players that have come up sore or have come up with poor sleep and are having that poor recovery score. Um, what yep. particular, what sort of you go to when you're monitoring or, or, or uh, responding yep. to those types of data sets? Yeah, so if they're, the, the way I set up my data is if they're outside their optimal zone, it then becomes a conversation with the player to see what's actually going wrong. If they've got excessive soreness, then that they would go to the medical staff and see, okay, what is the issue there? We would then look at the training session. Okay, the training session is an intense session. Then a decision has to be made. All right, we think this is high risk. Then we need to modify this session for the player. So the player might do parts of that session or they might do no parts of that session, depending on the severity. However, this, this is part of the communication uh, with the coaching staff that there's a meeting post that data in the morning to see this is the situation and then we um, need to modify this training session uh, because the reason is why are we modifying it because they've reported things that mean they're outside their optimal zone which means their risk of injury is significant all right so it's much better for them to have a modified session than to get injured and then be not playing for six weeks that's the whole crux of it however that's going to take work just to get everyone on board with our coaching staff and everything like that so they understand these processes. And in this part of my career, I work a lot with coaches so they get to understand what we're trying to do in the performance departments. And just last night, I, I presented to over 100 coaches exactly about that. What should you expect from your performance department? So they're on board. So we're all working together uh, to get the ultimate goal, which is for our athlete to perform. 
So, so just to dovetail off that, you know, if we're looking, your example there was soreness coming up from a, a training session. Um, I, I might just use the sleep example as well. And it sort of goes back to what you're saying around educating the athlete. So if there was a system in place whereby it's able to flag the athlete that they have had poor sleep, and there's also a way to educate them within the application like we have with SmarterBase um, or through education from the sports science team or yourself. That's, I guess, I just wanted to... to um, reconfirm the importance of education you can either utilize the software available or you can utilize your own experience and your own personnel to really drum home the point of okay you know we've monitored you sleep sleep has become an issue for us it's been a flag for here for, for us here okay do, do we need to get you um in, in a cooler environment during camp what's you know let's say it's during camp what, what's going on with the sleeping arrangement um how's the bed going I, I guess just to reiterate some of the points you've made, Craig, throughout the presentation, education and communication with the key stakeholders is, is paramount here once you've got that data. Yeah, absolutely. And we even have, okay, so with, with the Smarter Base system, we have, um, particularly with our workforce or our, our corporate clients, okay, they've identified that their sleep was poor they're outside their optimal performance zone. So then feedback goes straight back to them as an alert that, okay, you're outside your optimal performance zone for in a corporate or workforce environment. That means their decision-making mightn't be right. Your sleep is outside the zone. Okay, go here, go to X because here's information on what to do with your sleep. And if you need more information, let's, let's have a chat. Fantastic. And Jens has just followed up with some questions around handling people that, that have reported a poor recovery score. Jens is asking around top up conditioning sessions for subs match day um, one, match day or match day plus one. Also taking into account the mess, uh, mental aspect as well and how. So um, a couple of shorthand notes there for people. Craig, if you can maybe elaborate and explain that to, to the audience and also um, address Jens's question. Yeah, it's a very, very good point. And then you've you've got these, it's a very good point, Jens, about the psychological component. I, I am very, um, that's a major part of my work as well. After I did my doctorate in, in sports sciences that I studied psychology, because I think it's so valuable and it's under underestimated that you've got these players that are not playing and then they've got to do more running on a match day uh, plus one, even though often they're compromised because it could be a late game, their sleep is compromised and all this sort of stuff. Sometimes that gets lost in translation and there's injuries happen on that match day minus one session. So we need to be aware of that. So Jens, how I say it is, okay, you know, football, all these team sports, they, they are team sports played by individuals. So this is what... Uh, our system or the smarter base system allows us to do is to look at individuals even though they're in a team and then someone you know you could be outside your optimal performance zone we just need to go okay all right is this session do we just tweak this session a little bit you know because we've got to fit this into the whole process there's a there's there's the science and then there's the art and mm -hmm. you know because we're dealing with humans and not laboratory rats um, and so someone could have had a poor sleep because they're anxious, they're upset, uh, because they didn't get chosen. Um, players can sometimes have poor sleeps post a, a poor result. So we need to manage that and work with that. Yeah. That's a great answer. Um, we have another question come in from, from Joseph. So uh, Craig, if I can just uh, rephrase some of the questioning here from your previous work experiences, work experience, what are some of the key solutions by yourself or by coaches when a player produces and they are undertrained, um, is it always the case where they just simply did not meet the physical load expected for the session, or are there other considerations as well as to why someone might be considered undertrained? Yeah, I think if you're talking about a session where they flag red, where they haven't done the work in that session that you would expect them to be, if that's if that's what we're talking about there, that's a very interesting one because we actually have a paper on that where that really identified that is a issue that is potentially a player hiding a fact that they could have some injury so i'm always aware of that that not that they're just their fitness is below but what is actually going on because players i've got a, a feeling a lot of the a lot of the time they know they're injured before they're injured and how i mean that is that they can 
get through a training session, all right, and they could manage. You've got a sore hamstring. We all know it. I, you know, I've got a sore hamstring. I can get through this training session. What will I do? I won't be explosive. I won't be that, but I'll, I'll get by. If we didn't have the technology and the monitoring, we wouldn't really see that. But then when it shows up on the dashboard, oh, that player is 10% below. Is that normal? No, it's not normal. I think that's wise for investigation just to see why, because it mightn't be, it might be multiple reasons. People might say, oh, he's just not fit. Uh, no, hang on. That's a very simplistic answer where what I'd say is, okay, what's going on? Are they, is there something going on psychologically? Is there something going on physiologically that we haven't picked up um, and we need to explore that? Good answer again. We, we, we picked the right guy to put on the, uh, the, the panel, Craig. Um, I don't see any other questions coming through. If you have any questions, there's Craig email, Craig's email on the screen here um, or my own email. It's just james at fusionsport.com. Thank you very much. You'll get the recording soon for Craig, Daniel, myself. Have a great day. Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.